heal them. Then, behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, that's when Jesus saw the faith of the friends that brought the man, he said to him, Man, so he's now speaking to the paralyzed man, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, that's often the mark of a scribe or a Pharisee. They live their lives out of their head rather than their heart and their soul and their spirit. They began to reason or even question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Let's pray together. And uh, I would ask you to pray with me, and pray for yourself, whatever you need tonight. And we often limit Uh, healing services to physical healing that's one aspect of healing no doubt but God does more than physical healing he he can heal mentally he can heal emotionally he can heal spiritually he can heal relationships he can heal marriages he can do all sorts of healing so I don't know what your need is I hope that you realize he can meet any of those needs so let's pray together and just pray for yourself and bring your need to him now Father we come to you as the Lord God Almighty, for whom nothing is too hard. And we thank you that we come in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit, who has been poured out at Pentecost, and who gives gifts to the church. And one of those gifts um, is the gift of healing, or the gifts of healing. And we ask you, Lord, tonight, we don't have it, we don't, own it, and we don't have anything to offer anybody except as a channel of your blessing and of your power and your love. And so we humble ourselves before you. We ask for the cleansing of the precious blood of Christ again. And we ask that your power would be manifested in your church and in this place tonight for needy folk, whatever their need might be. And take your word tonight, Lord, and may it come in power and authority, and transformation for people's lives here this evening. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I want you to understand this evening that he is the healing presence. And this quote that I have on the screen is an important one. It's from a woman called Leanne Payne, and she actually wrote a book called The Healing Presence. And this is what she says. The power to heal and be healed is available Because God himself is in our midst. His presence and his power are mysteriously one. Now don't move on just yet, please. I want you to see this quotation. The power to heal and be healed is available because God himself is in our midst. And I want to reiterate what David said at the beginning of of the meeting. This fellow here has no power to heal anybody. I've never healed anybody in my life, never saved anybody in my life, never delivered anybody in my life, okay? This church or this mission hall can't do that for you either. No human being on their own can do anything to help anyone, not even help ourselves. I mean, we can't even help ourselves, let alone help anyone else. The thing to understand is it's the healing presence of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit that transforms people's lives. It is God himself who is in the midst. He is the healer. 
He is the healing presence. And if there's a key to healing, it's learning this, which is on the second slide. Leanne Payne goes on to say, to invoke the mighty presence of our God and become vessels through which he ministers in our midst. That is our objective. To invoke, to engage by faith with the presence of God in our midst so that we can become vessels through which he ministers to others. Healing is God's presence in our midst. Have you got it? Healing is God's presence in our midst, not the precocious effort of some individual, whether they claim to be a healer or not. It's not about people. It's not about men and women. It's not about churches. It's not about doctrines as such. It's not about movements. It's not about philosophies of ministry. It's not about formulae, okay? It's about Christ, his power in the midst when he's among us. And we need to engage with that presence. That's how healing comes. In fact, I'll tell you, that's how anything comes. That's how everything of any good, any worth, any lasting value will come when the presence of God is in the midst of his people. He is the healing presence. And so the best thing I could do for any of you tonight is to make you aware that God is here and to lead you into a consciousness of the presence of God. And that, even as we pray with people individually tonight, that is not a mere preliminary. It's actually, I believe, the most important thing of all to realize that the power to be healed and the power to heal is available because God is in the midst. It's his power and his presence that are mysteriously one. In other words, where God's about, he does stuff. Simple as that. When he's around. And we know he's everywhere, of course. You know, you can't escape his presence. He's omnipresent. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about his manifest presence when he shows up and does things. Some people call it miracles, signs and wonders. But the point I'm making is, it's impossible for God to be tangibly around and something not happen. And here we have in this story in Luke, Luke chapter 5, it says at the end of verse 17, the power of the Lord was present there to heal them. Do you see the power and the presence of God came together? Jesus was there and the power of God to heal was with Jesus. Practicing the presence of God is vital. This is a, a little bit of a detour before we go back to healing. But I want you to understand. I mean, you can go to the Christian bookshop or go on Amazon or whatever, and you can search. I mean, you should try this for a laugh. Google um, the key to the Christian life and see how many books come up or how many seminars or teachings or series or whatever about what the key to the Christian life is. And I suppose that's a little bit unfair because... There's no doubt about it. There are, there are many keys to living the Christian life, and it's hard to isolate one thing over another. You need to be filled with the Spirit, baptized in the Spirit. Uh, you, need, you, know, you need to be surrendered to the Lord and consecrated to Him to have victory over temptation. You need to be holy and all those kind of things. But I would say that along with hearing the voice of God, which is one of the key things in the Christian life, along with hearing the voice of God, one of the on other areas that is vital is practicing the presence of God. Now, in our little home church, we have been meditating on this for a couple of weeks. And we've been learning that if, if you do not practice the presence of God, you'll practice the presence of something else or someone else. Now, let me explain that. There's at least four things that you will practice the presence of if you don't practice the presence of God. One is you can practice the presence of sin. Now, what am I talking about? Well, we all sin, don't we? We shouldn't, but we do. And we all, even the holiest of us, have besetting sins, and at times we trip up. And the fact of the matter is, then the, the accuser of the brethren, Satan comes in, condemns us. And even when we confess our sins, and we know God's faithful and just to forgive us, very often we stay under a cloud of condemnation, and we can do the devil's work well, well for him. He can take a vacation, and we keep humming ourselves over our head with guilt and shame and all the rest. And that is how we practice the presence of sin. 
In other words, we're not looking out of ourselves to the crucified Christ. And, the, and I, I, I'm going to put this next graphic on the slide. And I want us throughout this meeting tonight to be looking to the crucified Christ. And understand that the help that you need is outside of yourself. You understand? So practicing the presence of sin isn't going to get you anywhere. You know, if you practice the presence of sin, guess what happens? The sin gets bigger. Have you ever heard the, the, the saying that the solution's not in the problem? The solution is not in the problem. So stop looking at the problem. Some people are practicing the presence of sin. when they, You need to look out from your sin, your temptation, your addiction, whatever it is. That's what you need release from tonight. You need to look out of yourself to the crucified Son of God who bore your sins in his own body on the tree. And he is the way to get free. Other people practice the presence of self. And Christians are experts at this. And what I mean is, they're so self-obsessed, the navel gaze all the time, they're introspective, you know what that means? They're always, very often, looking inside at what's wrong with them and where they fall down and where they don't measure up. And they're often perfectionists, especially Christians who've grown up in Christian homes or very legalistic church backgrounds because they've always been told what they should do and what they shouldn't do. And so they live under this kind of scepter of a false holiness of the law that's requiring them to live a certain way. And of course, there's this fallenness in their heart and they find it very difficult to measure up because nobody can measure up. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. One translation says we've missed the mark. Every single one of us miss, misses the mark. So if you're always gazing inside at yourself, you're, you're always going to be going around and round and round in circles chasing your moral tail. Because the help is where? Outside of yourself. The help is in Christ. So you have to become present to your sin. You have to become present to your own foibles, your own self-issues. I'm not doubting that. Your own wounds, your own hang-ups, all that. But once you become present and aware of it by the power of the Holy Spirit, you then need to look out of yourself and look to Jesus Christ who, through whose wounds you're healed. Your wounds will be healed through his wounds. Some practice the presence of sin, practice the presence of self, other people practice the presence of sickness. Now, I'm not one of these crazy people that say, you know, if you're sick, pretend you're not sick, you know? And that's faith. That's blarney. That's nonsense. If you've got a cold, don't run around saying to everybody, I don't have the cold. <laughs> I don't have the cold. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm healed in heaven. I don't have the cold. That's garbage, all right? If you've got the cold, you've got the cold. And if you're healed, you'll be healed of the cold and you'll not have the cold. Do you understand what I mean? But what I'm talking about is not owning an illness or disease as your identity. That's a different thing. And some people have wrapped up their identity and sense of worth in a condition that they have. Where you hear people talking about, well, this is my, and you name the disease, whatever it is, my this, my that, my the other. Don't do that. Um, don't practice the presence of, of your disease or your sickness. Now I'm going to be straight with you tonight. Not everybody gets healed in this, in this life. And not everybody will get healed tonight, I'm sure. Not everybody was healed in the Bible. And Jesus didn't heal everybody. Okay? But what I'm saying is, you ought not to practice the presence of whatever your affliction is, whether you're healed or not. That's not your identity. It's not who you are in Christ. So some people practice the presence of sin, they practice the presence of self, they practice the presence of sickness, and they practice the presence of Satan. Okay? Now just so as you know, I believe in Satan, I believe in demons. I, I've seen many, many deliverances over the years. But what I do know is many people get obsessed with it to the extent that they see demons under every bush. I heard a man say, I don't see a demon under every bush, I see two demons under every bush. And that might be the case because there's a lot of demons around, okay? But the fact of the matter is, two-thirds of the angels in heaven didn't fall. Only a third of the angels fell. We don't know what demons are, technically, but let's say they're fallen angels. Well, if that's the case, if there's two demons under every bush, there's four angels, right? So don't focus on the demons, okay? And don't get obsessed with the enemy, and, and some people who have seen deliverance, who have been involved in deliverance, or have had deliverance, 
get totally and utterly obsessed with the kingdom of darkness and it's all they start seeing. And you know something? The healing and the freedom is not found there. It's found outside of yourself. It's found in Jesus Christ. And practicing the presence of God. That's where the healing is. Looking out to the crucified Savior who is with us by his Spirit tonight. So let's look at this passage again, verse 17. This verse, at the very end of it, it says, And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. The power of the Lord was present to heal them. The NIV says, And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. That's the emphasis. The power of the Lord, God, was with Jesus to heal the sick. The New Living Translation puts it like this. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. The Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. The literal standard version says this. And the power of the Lord was dash to heal them. That's the literal standard version. The power of the Lord was dashed to heal them. In other words, it was God's will, God's intention, God's desire to heal those people. And the Aramaic Bible in plain English says this. The Lord Jehovah was there to heal them. Right? This is God now. Is with Jesus, in Jesus, to heal the people. Now, in case you didn't know it, it was the presence of Jesus that brought the presence of God into this world in a way that never had been before. The incarnation, God became flesh, dwelt among us. And so when Jesus came into the world in his earthly ministry, he said, the kingdom of God has come near to you. The kingdom of God has come into your midst. Why? Because Jesus was standing among them. On another occasion, Matthew chapter 12, when they accused him of casting out demons by the prince of the demons, Beelzebub, he said, if I, by the finger of God, cast demons out. Another gospel says, if I, by the spirit of God, cast demons out, the kingdom of God has come into your midst. You see, Jesus is the kingdom of God. Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he is the rule and the reign of God on the earth. You understand? It was the presence of Jesus that brought the presence of God. Now, I like that translation, the Aramaic Bible in plain English. The Lord Jehovah was there to heal them. Because some of you might be familiar with the compound names of Jehovah in the Old Testament. I think there's nine of them. You know, Jehovah, two of them I'll give you. Jehovah Jarrah. The Lord, my provider. And another is Jehovah Rapha. The Lord, my healer. And I think those two are very pertinent to what we're about tonight. But I want you to understand what the, all the compound names of Jehovah were about in the Old Testament. When God revealed his personal name to Moses at the burning bush, what did he say his name was? I am. Now, I am is an unfinished sentence, just in case you didn't know. I am What? God is saying, I am Moses, period. And he he went on later to say, I am that I am. I am what I am. Well, that really helps us, doesn't it? (laughs) But what he's saying is, I am the ultimate reality of everything that is. I am God. And therefore, an unfinished sentence, I am, is a sentence that can be filled in by you. It's effectively a blank check where we're... God is saying, I am whatever you need. What do you need tonight? The mighty thing is that if God is going to meet our needs, as he did for the Israelites in the Old Testament going through the wilderness, as he revealed himself to meet their needs, to provide for them, to protect them, to be their banner, etc., etc., and their healer, if God's going to meet our needs, there's going to have to come a time when he meets our greatest need, and our greatest need is for a Savior, because we're sinners and we're lost. And the miracle of the gospel is that he sent his son and he called him Jehovah saves. Jesus. Yeshua. Jehovah saves. But he doesn't just save. He heals. He delivers. He restores. He transforms lives. And so my job tonight and our job together is to do what it says here in verse 18 of our passage. 
they brought this man, they sought to bring in this man and lay him before Jesus. In a few moments' time, that's what we're going to do. We're going to help you, bring you to the feet of Jesus. You see it in verse 19 as well. It says, uh, They let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. Do you see what I'm hammering away at here tonight? The healing presence. It's all about him. It's all about what he does. It's all about us getting into his presence by faith and touching the presence of God and miracles can happen. Now let's be really practical. Verse 20. When he, Jesus saw their faith, now remember there's four friends and it's the faith of the friends that are letting the man down through the roof. When Jesus saw their faith, do you know that Jesus sees our faith? Even if it's only the size of a mustard seed, he sees our faith. Paul, on one occasion, in Acts chapter 19, I think it is, uh, he saw a man's faith, and this paralyzed man, crippled man from birth, was healed. Acts 14, I beg your pardon, Acts 14, 9. So if God sees our faith, if Jesus saw our faith, if the apostle Paul could see faith, what does faith look like? Well, the book of James tells us that faith without works is dead. And in fact, James goes on to say, or uh, previous in the chapter, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. What James is saying is true faith will be evidenced in some kind of outworking. So if Jesus sees faith, Paul saw it. How did they see it and what does it look like? Well, I think it must look like some kind of works. Now listen carefully to what I'm saying. Another word for faith is expectancy. So you've kind of got to be expecting God to do something. And that's like an internal thing, isn't it? Expectancy. But there's more than that I think required. Not just expectancy, but activity. Faith without works is dead. Activity as opposed to passivity. Do you know what passivity is? Christians are brilliant at this. Sitting around, doing nothing, expecting God just to zap you. That's passivity. And I think faith that has works, has expectancy and activity. Let me illustrate it like this. In John chapter 5, there's a man at a pool in Bethesda and he's been lying there for 38 years. And this, whether it was a legend or true, the jury's out on that one. But they believed the Jews that there was an angel came down and rippled the waters of this pool. And the first fella or girl to get into the water who was uh, in any way afflicted would be healed in that moment. And this man had been there for 38 years and still couldn't get down into that pool. His gripe was, I have nobody to help me. And then Jesus comes along, rubs salt in the wound, and he says, do you want to be healed? You know, 38 years, what would you say to that? I know what I'd feel like saying. Are you having a laugh? What a, what a stupid question. What a stupid, what an insensitive, hurtful question. But Jesus doesn't ask stupid, insensitive, hurtful questions. You see, Jesus knew that in this man's heart he had given up. They'd been lying there 38 years and there was resignation to his condition. And he didn't believe anymore. Do you want to be made well, he said to him. Now, what I think we can take out of that is, and what I'm uh, emphasizing with expectancy and activity and not passivity is, you need to do all in your power to position yourself for healing. You need to do all that you can to position yourself for healing. Whatever that might be. So I'll get people to pray for me till kingdom come and if God doesn't heal me, he'll heal me in heaven. But that's not going to stop me getting prayer for healing. Do you understand? 
And God heals some. He doesn't heal all. I don't have an answer for that. Straight up, I don't. There's a mystery to a lot of it. There's some times we might know reasons for it, but I don't know the reasons. And Jesus can heal where there is no faith. Did you know that? Lazarus didn't have any faith. He was dead. (laughs) The corpse doesn't have any faith, does it? And so the voice of Jesus Christ, the sovereign Lord, calling Lazarus come forth, has the power to resurrect the dead. And I believe that. I believe that. When Jesus said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out demons, though I have never seen the dead raised, seen a few people waking up in church, (laughs) but I've never seen the dead raised, but you see, I don't judge scripture by my experience. I judge my experience by Scripture, so I live in hope. And I'm not looking at anybody to die on me tonight, so we can practice that. And I'm not looking to die that some other person can raise me from the dead. But if the need was to arise, I believe God can do this. Jesus can heal with no faith, but that being said, you see the miracles in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. Almost every time there was an act of faith that triggered the healing. Sometimes it was the faith of the sick person themselves. And so you get the woman with the issue of blood. She touches the hem of Jesus' garment. Jesus turns to her. And after the little discussion about power going out of him, uh, he says to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your faith. Sometimes it's the faith of the people bringing the sick person that we've just read about here in Luke chapter 5. The four friends... The fellow must not have had any faith. But the four friends had faith. You could be with someone here tonight and you're a friend. Or the person mightn't even be with you tonight. And we have that in scripture as well. That there were some who came on behalf of sick folk. You've got the centurion that came on behalf of a servant. And a servant wasn't with him when he, he, he went to Jesus. You've got the Syrophoenician woman that came on behalf of her child. And they came kind of in proxy. For a person that needed healing. But it was their faith. That that Jesus recognized. And even outside the gospels. At the end of the epistle to James. You've got a a whole teaching there. About if any of you are sick. Let them call for the elders. And they will come and anoint the sick with oil. And if they have sinned. Their sins will be forgiven. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the sick person will be raised up. Now, we either believe that or we don't. Do you believe that? And I know half the church in Ulster doesn't believe it, maybe more than half of the church. There's a wee debate going on on Facebook, I have to be careful here, and they were debating over whether to read the NIV or not read the NIV, and it had to be the King James Version. Sorry if I offend anybody tonight. But, and, it was all, and they were saying, oh, I, uh, Mark 16, they don't have all of Mark 16 in the NIV. And I was so close. But I didn't do it. So no better now. But I was so close to go on and say, what does it matter to you if you don't believe Mark 16, the second half of it? What does it matter whether it's in the Bible or not? (laughs) That's the truth. Do you believe that God can heal? Do you believe that he does heal? Do you believe that he will heal? Look at what it says here. Verse 20. He saw their faith and he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven. Now, that's interesting to me. You know why? Because the fellow didn't ask for his sins to be forgiven. And the four friends didn't ask for this fellow's sins to be forgiven. They were there for his healing. So was Jesus at. Not only do you ask people that you want to be well, now you're doing things they're not asking you to do. By the way, he does that. You can come to him for healing and he might do something else in your life. Just letting you know he's Lord. We're not Lord. It's not up to us to dictate what he does. But why did he forgive their sin? Why? Well, I can't prove this. But I have a hunch that this man, his physical condition, was somehow connected to shame or guilt or something in his past that he needed forgiveness for. And Please hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying all sickness is to do with sin in your life. That is not what I am saying at all. But what I am saying is I know enough, and doctors will even tell you, 
that if you have enough going on up here and going down on here, it can affect you physically. It can affect you. And the Lord forgive his sin. And can I say to you, that is the greatest healing of all. To have your sins forgiven. To have peace with God. To look out of yourself, the crucified Christ, and know that he was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquity. The punishment of your peace was upon him, and with his stripes you're healed. Spiritual healing. Knowing you're, you're right with God. Knowing that you're, you're, you're in a communion fellowship with a heavenly Father. Knowing that you're in heaven in earth, and one day heaven with God. You know, if you're not saved tonight, that's the greatest healing you could get. To have your sins forgiven. And there's another healing too, and that's forgiving other people's sins. And some people are bound up. I've seen people healed when they've forgiven other people and delivered when they've forgiven other people. I've seen people delivered instantaneously without any exorcism or running around shouting and getting on in a moment when they forgive a person. I'm not saying that always happens, but I've seen it happen. Forgiveness is such a miracle. And so I want to invite you tonight to step into the healing presence. To consciously engage now with the healing presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I don't just want you to say a wee prayer in your head. I don't just want you to agree with me with an amen. I want you actually to engage with visible faith. And what I mean by that is, not visible to all us, it doesn't matter what we think but visible to God. And I mean by that an expectancy, but also an activity where you do something. Let me tell you a story as I close. I was preaching a number of years ago in a a town in Portadown and we called the healing line at the end. And there was a girl there who had had a a debilitating condition, a viral condition that had caused some kind of a paralysis down the right side of her body and she'd been going for physio and she was seeing a consultant and she had been at her uh, I think it was her penultimate uh, appointment and she was told that there was no measurable improvement and it was likely in fact probable that she would remain with this condition if there was no dramatic change on her next appointment and this was a, a you know, a young woman who was very fit, active, ran marathons, all that kind of stuff. A teacher, a mother of two children, and this was awful. She was limping around the place, you know, on a crutch. She came up to the healing line that morning. Now, I'd already prayed for the sick, as I will do, or get you to pray, actually. i already done all that, and a few people responded. And then we call the healing line, which we'll do tonight for anyone who feels the Lord has been working on you, but you need a little bit more prayer. And she came up, and I had the privilege of praying with with this girl. And I prayed with her. And there wasn't any, like, flashing lights in heaven that she had. She didn't hear angels singing or anything like that. And nothing. There was nothing, actually. And then I said to her, and she had this uh, weakness atrophy in her arm and her hand I says will you take my hand and squeeze my hand now this is something she couldn't do and she took my hand and she couldn't squeeze and I said do it again and she did it again and the next time she did it she nearly broke my finger (laughs) and then I said to her right and she was starting to get emotional now I says right let's do something else what else the leg okay the leg try and stand on one leg this is something she couldn't do normally and she stood on one leg she was a little bit wobbly but the longer she stood on the one leg the stronger it got and before the end of that meeting she was able to hop from now there must have been a platform I'd say up to about there from the ground level in this church she was able to hop right up on the stage and God now listen it's God nothing to do with me and I'm not saying that to sound good. I, I, honestly, if you're relying on anything from me, you're in big trouble. Because I can just about sometimes get myself up in the morning. That's the honest truth. 
God touched that girl. And she's never, she's never looked back. And it was a miracle. But what, I want you to, what I'm telling you that for is to create faith in you, to know that God does this. But I'm also wanting you to understand, listen to me, don't be passive. Faith without works is dead. Expect expectancy and activity. I'm going to call upon you to do that just now. Do you have a need in your body, your mind, your soul, your spirit? Now, if you can stand your feet, I'm going to ask you all to stand, please. Maybe we could have the back doors open a wee bit to let a bit of a draft in. It's, it's warm. Maybe it's just me up here. But Now, let me take my time with you doing this. And there'll be an opportunity for you to get prayer from other people in just a moment. And some of you have seen me maybe do this before. And I think it's good. I'll tell you a number of reasons why it's good. It's good because it shows you it's nothing to do with me. It's the power of God. And you can pray for yourself. And you can pray for people around you. Now, before I do that, I, I want to announce a couple of things. Uh, and th- th- these didn't come from me. The, 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 one of them came from someone who's not even here tonight in a foreign country who had a dream. And in that dream, they saw this, uh, uh, this gathering, maybe not tonight, so I don't know, but this hall and the people in the hall and some of the people that are here tonight, they saw And they saw people who were seeking healing. And these were the things they were seeking healing from, for. And I believe that these are what we call words of knowledge. And what that simply means is God is communicating that he has a desire to touch people with these particular conditions. And if you hear your condition, then that that can give you faith to believe for a healing tonight. So um, these were the things in the dream. They said there was someone with residual stroke symptoms. There was someone else with an eating disorder. They wanted free from. There was someone else with memory loss. Someone else with past regrets. And another with a broken heart who needed healing. I also have a friend who sent a vision to me that they had this afternoon. And they had seen four angels in this gathering. As I was preaching, they saw four angels show up. The first was specifically there to minister to people's souls. Your soul, if you have a broken heart. Mind is part of your soul, your emotions, your behavior, part of your soul. So there was an angel to minister to people's souls. The second angel was to minister to people's spirits, spiritual problems, spiritual issues. The third angel was to minister to people's bodies, if you have sickness in your body or disease or weakness of some kind. And the fourth angel was to minister to relationships, broken relationships. And they said that they felt that as I would make mention of each of these angels, that the power of them would manifest in the room. Kind of like stirring the water. I don't know if you believe any of that or not, but angels, you know, God is omnipresent, but he sends angels to do his bidding. So anyway, as you're standing there, what is your condition? What is your thing that you need healed from? I want you to pray for it now. And if it's appropriate, uh, you know what I mean by that, put your hand on the area, if you can. Just put your hand on the area. Forget about everybody around you. Just put your hand on the area, okay? If it's appropriate. So if you have a problem with your shoulder, put your hand on your shoulder. All right? Or wherever, if it's appropriate. And I want you to pray now. And I just want you to whisper it, okay? It's important that you whisper it. Just whisper it. The next door neighbor doesn't need to hear. But just say, Lord, would you please heal this, whatever it is, okay? Just say that to the Lord. Lord, would you please heal in Jesus' name, would you heal this? If there's something not there that should be there, ask the Lord to put it there. If there's, you know, a disease, ask the Lord to take it away. If there's pain, ask him to take it away. Um, If there's a weakness or whatever it might be, you know what it is. Just ask him. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to whatever, whatever needs to be done, Okay. And if it's a mental thing, an emotional thing, you can pray about that too. So uh, 
Do that now. And thank the Lord. Now the next thing I want you to do is, I want you to speak to the condition. This is not praying. This is what Jesus did. You, you notice that Jesus, I don't think he once, when he was healing someone, prayed for the healing. He spoke to the condition with the authority that he had, and he's given us authority. And you speak to the condition. So if it's pain, I want you to speak it out, whisper it and say, pain, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Or whatever the disease is, command it to go in Jesus' name. Whatever the affliction is, if it's something that needs to be there, speak it to be there. Say, I command you to be there in Jesus' name. Or whatever it is. Just You, you get the gist. But not, not asking God now for it. Commanding in Jesus' name. Speaking in Jesus' name. Taking the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And speaking it. Speaking it. Okay? Do that now. Now I'm going to pray over you now in a moment. And then what I'm going to do is, and this is not going to work for everybody. It'll not work for everybody anyway. But what I mean is, there'll be no results for a lot of people because you might need to go through a test. You might need to go to a doctor. The condition you might have mightn't be actually something you feel and sense in your body right now. But for some of you who have had pain or some discomfort or some thing that you can read in your body as being there or not there, you may notice a difference, okay? I'm going to pray. Lord, I thank you for the power of your word and the power of the gospel and the power of healing in the scriptures that testifies you're a good God and you're able to do these things. And we ask you now to heal and restore minds, bodies, souls, and spirits. And I speak the healing of Christ over this gathering tonight. And I command disease to leave and sickness and pain to leave. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go in Jesus' name. Be healed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Now, I want you to test. If you can, you know, as I said, some things can't be tested. But I want you to test your affliction right now, if you can. Now, forget about everybody around you. And don't start looking around you at what people are doing. All right? Just concentrate on yourself. Is there something that you can test? So if it's one leg, can you stand on it and see? Okay, don't worry about it. This is, this is what I'm talking about. Expectancy and activity, not just passivity. Not saying, oh, I'll do that when I get home. Do it now. You're in the meeting. You're in the presence, the healing presence of God. Do it now. For the glory of God, do it now. Test it. Try and test it now. I'm not going to stop till you test it. You'll be here to midnight if you don't test it. Now, is there anyone in the gathering and you would say that from testing that right now or from just even the prayer that you, you can tell that there's at least an 80% difference in, in whatever the condition was? Now, as I've said, not everybody... We'll be able to do that. But is there anybody here? And you'd raise your hand by saying there's definitely a tangible, significant difference in my condition or pain or whatever. Okay. Put your hand up if that's you. Yeah. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna point you out or get you up or anything like that. Don't be embarrassed. I'm not gonna do that. But just raise your hand to testify what God has done. Is there anybody? One. Praise the Lord. You can put your hand down. Anybody else? Okay, we're going to do it again. Because I think some of you... Well, we'll do it again. Right? Now, don't tell me at the door. Right? Because what you're doing is you're robbing other people of faith to believe for the thing. Because the testimony of Jesus is to tell forth what he's done and it creates faith. All right? So pray for that condition. I'm talking to people who can, can tell, and we'll pray for everybody else in the morning. But everybody pray for whatever it is. Pray for whatever it is. And say, Lord, please, in Jesus' name, would you heal this? Lord, please, in Jesus' name, would you heal whatever it is? Okay? And hopefully we'll hear reports later on. But I believe the Lord will do stuff tonight. I want you now to command that thing to go in Jesus' name, or to change in whatever way it needs to change or to be right or to be healed 
speak to it. And if it's an emotional, if it's depression, if it's a fogginess of the mind, if it's uh, long COVID, command it to go in Jesus' name. Whatever it is, command it to go in Jesus' name. If it's fear, if it's suicidal thoughts, I don't care. We don't need to wrestle demons on the floor tonight. The power of the Lord is present here to heal you. And he's greater. All right? So command the thing to go in Jesus' name. Command it to go. So Lord, I pray that you'll honor your word and you'll glorify Jesus as you did in this healing of the, the paralyzed man. It says they glorify God and said that we've seen strange things today. I'm sure some of them will say that after the night. But Lord, you show them the supernatural power that you have tonight for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Now test it. Test it. Test it if you can. If there's something that you can test, I don't care if you have to come out into the aisle a wee bit or whatever, or bend down or crouch or whatever. Do whatever you need to do. Do whatever you need to do to test it. Okay? <coughs> Is there anybody else and you can tell that something's a lot better? Would you raise your hand? God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless. God bless. Praise the Lord. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now there's multiple people in this room who are testifying. Now if you have 80% healing and it's not complete yet, you get more prayer, okay? And pray again. Even pray again. Even Jesus prayed twice for a blind man. The first time he saw men like trees walk and the second time he got healed. Now why he did that, we can discuss, but he did it. So that allows me to do it twice, all right? So if you need three times, I'm not Jesus, so if you need it three times, come to the front and get prayer. But look at all those people. I'd love to hear some of those testimonies. Is anybody willing to say? I'm not putting anybody in the spot. Anybody willing to say what, what, what you felt better of? Anybody? It's okay if you don't. Shout it out. Nobody? That's okay. That's all right. You can tell someone afterwards. But see, see what God can, can do. And nobody's even laying hands on you. Do you understand? Nobody's even laid hands on you. But there will be an opportunity now. The prayer team's going to come out. And you can come forward for anointing of oil. And it says the scripture about the elders doing it. But Jesus also sent out the two by two disciples to anoint with oil and heal the sick. And they will anoint you with oil and pray for you. They'll be in twos up at the front here. If you don't want to be prayed for, up at the front of everybody. Now I would encourage you to do come to the front. okay? Because we haven't enough room to accommodate everybody. But if you have a particular need to be prayed for in private, there are private rooms and just say to someone about doing that. But this is a healing meeting and you have an opportunity in the presence of God to receive prayer for healing. So get it. So if I could have the, the, the healing team up to the front, please, the ones that will be praying. And whoever has the oil. And Joel will play quietly in the background. Are we singing or not? I don't know. We won't. I sing, but sing quiet. You sing quiet. You don't have to sing quiet. But um, play something quiet or because then we can hear what people are. Now listen, at any point, and, it, and listen, if you've felt the power of God on you in some way, if you're not baptizing the Holy Spirit, you're not moving the gifts of the Spirit. You, you want prayer for that? Come on. It's the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's not all just healing. It, whatever it is you need from God tonight, come and get prayer. Or just sit in God's presence and ask Him yourself. But don't let tonight go by without getting the help that you need. Let me just pray, and then we'll hand over to, to the team. Father, thank you for what you've done tonight. Thank you for these people who have testified some kind of healing in our midst already. And we give you praise and glory and honor for that. We want your name to be glorified, Lord. And every other name die in the dust. For Jesus alone is worthy. Jesus is the only one died for us. He's the only one who loved us. He's the only one who rose again for us. He's the only one who ascended to heaven and poured out the Holy Spirit. And he's the only one who's coming back for us. And we praise you tonight for what he's doing in our midst. And we pray as people come forward, I pray your blessing upon the folk that will pray for, for, the, for the people. And I pray that there'll be mighty healings for your glory tonight. And we'll go away with a spring in our step knowing that our God is real. And Lord, we have an NHS system that's broken. And we have doctors and nurses that are striking. And we need to see the healing power of Jesus in our day and generation. 
Lord, we need you to come. And we need you to show that you're able. Where the world is not able. Where medicine is not able. Where science is not able. You are able. Where psychiatrists are not able. Where counselors are not able. You are able. You are able. And we believe it. So come, we pray. And do what you alone can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, can I just say before you come, this is not a counseling service tonight, okay? So we can't spend half an hour with you counseling you and hearing your life story. Uh, And you might need that, but that's not what tonight's about, okay? It's for simple healing prayer, and just so as you understand it. All right? God bless you.